Good morning, everyone. In the last uh, session, we have talked about the X-ray films, uh, how they are used in taking the periapical uh, uh, radiographs or uh, bite wing radiographs or occlusal radiographs. The techniques which are used, which are commonly used at the chair site, to take up a specific uh, area of interest. Now, in this class, we'll be talking about the films as such, or the image receptors which are used in those particular techniques to take an uh, exact replica of the area of interest which we are interested in during the uh, practice of, uh, of a normal dental physician. So in this class, we'll be talking about the various films uh, used uh, in the various techniques or in the various uh, uh, types of uh, films which are used for different purposes, uh, which are used at the chair sites, which are the first line of investigations as such. And we'll be talking a little about the grids, which are nothing but an uh, extra adjunct or a specific purpose which serves a specific purpose doing extra oral projections. Now uh, apart from that we will also be talking about the various techniques of uh, processing, how we uh, go about processing a normal film, any film for that matter, and the various uh, techniques or various types of uh, processing methods. So let's start with the image receptors as such. Now image receptors is nothing but a synonym which is used for the extra films which are used in uh, taking a specific uh, image of our interest. Now what are these image receptors? Now the image receptors as the name suggests itself, it is something a receptive vehicle which can take the exact replica of the image which is produced by the x-rays. Now so it is it is nothing but a, a combination of a, some, of a vehicle which is nothing but a gelatinous matrix which can hold these films at a specific uh, place in the oral cavity. Along with that, a uh, special uh, chemical or special molecules, which are nothing but uh, light sensitive immersion, which is nothing but it is receptive to the specific X-rays or the light rays which are falling upon the ima uh, image receptors, so that a latent image and hence after processing, we get an exact replica. So what uh, you know, an immersion is nothing but a colloidal suspension of a solid in a liquid matrix. So what are the requirements of an image receptor? Now, if if a particular dental physician has to go for a specific uh, image receptor, he would look for a few points, pointers, or a requirements or basic requirements which can enable him to take an exact replica with least amount of uh, fuss uh, with the dental physician and the maximum amount of comfort for the patient. So what are those requirements? First is the flexibility. Obviously, the internal cavity is a limited uh, space. We've got a limited space within which the dental physician has to uh, operate or uh, take the images off. So the image receptor has to be adequately flexible so that it can confirm to the shapes, various shapes and the arches of the maxillary arch or the mandibular arch. Also, not compromising on the image quality so that it might it might not be geometrically distorted. So there has to be an optimum benchmark which has to be maintained, which can give adequate flexibility as well as no, uh, uh, exact uh, replication of the geometry. Next, the since this is uh, subjected to a various number of chemicals within the processing solution, now all these chemicals shouldn't have any negative impact on the composition, either the composition of the image receptor or the latent image which is produced on the uh, image receptor. So it, sh it should have a good shelf life. Obviously, uh, we cannot uh, uh, compromise on the shelf life or uh, since these are mildly to moderately expensive uh, and uh, also it should be uniformly translucent so that it has a specific uh, 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 image properties which can be later translated by the image uh, dental physician. Now the classification of the image receptors depending upon various based upon different uh, properties it can be classified whether it can be based upon the usage of these uh, image receptors whether used intraorally or extraorally. Now we have periapical radiographs, we have bite wing radiographs or occlusal radiographs which are all placed within the intraoral cavity hence they are called intraoral films and other kinds of extraoral films such as which are used to take like a submental vertex view or a PA view or for that matter, a lateral oblique uh, mandibular views. All these are extra oral films wherein the film receptor or the image receptor is placed outside the oral cavity to take a image exposure images. Now, depending upon the exposure, a direct exposure films or an indirect exposure films. Now, what this direct exposure? It is directly receptive to the X-rays which are produced by the X-ray tube. Now, these uh, image receptors have chemicals which are directly responsive 
to the x-rays which are produced now indirect is it is uh, not directly uh, related to the x-rays which are produced but they're sensitive to the light which is produced by the x-rays so there are few chemicals which absorb x-rays now they uh, after absorbing x-rays it releases out a uh, light a uh, visible light within a uh, where uh, any of the spectra of the vibgia and this light is later uh, sensitive to the chemicals placed within the image receptor hence the image is produced now again based on the size we have a uh, various number of uh, uh, radiographs which are taken for specific purposes such as your periapicals or bite wings or occlusives depending upon the sizes we can again classify them and again based upon the speed uh, upon which uh, depending upon the patient exposure how much of exposure you are uh, uh, maintaining or uh, trying to limit yourself uh, to a specific uh, uh, image uh, uh, technique uh, depending upon the uh, amount of uh, uh, radiation you want the patient to be exposed to now depending upon the size of the film which are using depending upon the kilo voltage of the x-ray unit which are using we can uh, classify the various uh, radiographs or the image receptors upon the speed so as i was saying the uh, depending upon the uh, uh, sizes we can uh, classify the interval uh, uh, the image receptors as such now if we go for the intraoral films which are nothing but direct exposure directly sensitive to the x-rays to produce the uh, henceforth uh, image now we can uh, classify them as periapical bite wing or occlusal now you can see the different sizes depending upon whether you are taking the anterior uh, uh, films or you are taking the posterior projections or whether using it for a, a, ch a child patient or an adult patient so depending upon that we have your periapical films which are nothing but to uh, image receptors which are specifically uh, maintained to take the periapex of a single tooth as such so depending upon the sizes size 0 1 2 the size 0 basically for the children uh, both the anterior and posterior it is 22 into 35 mm size 1 is uh, basically used for uh, adult anterior teeth or uh, ch in children it can be used for posterior teeth that is your uh, 24 into 40 and size 2 which is the most commonly used uh, radiograph which is nothing but uh, which is used for uh, posterior projections in a uh, adult patient now that is 31 into 41 mm now apart from that we have also bite wing uh, in, uh, projections which are nothing but which take the occlusals uh, part and the inter uh, interproximal bone uh, estimation for that we take a bite wing and the hence that is also uh, uh, taken according to the uh, patient and according to the uh, area wherein uh, we are trying to take the projection that is also divided into three sizes size 0 1 2 with the same dimensions now occlusal uh, we take uh, we take for uh, occlusal tables the entire arch is projected upon the uh, image receptor hence the size is also uh, slightly different which is 55 into 76 uh, mm now this uh, occlusals uh, can be bo uh, used both for the maxillary as well as mandibular uh, projections and the same kind of sizes used for uh, uh, children as well as uh, adults <coughs> now depending upon the speed of the film and now uh, as i was saying the speed of the film depends is nothing but the uh, capability of the film to convert this uh, x rays or uh, incident uh, radiation and production of a latent image on the image receptor so the rate of, of con conversion of these chemical uh, chemical uh, emulsions or light sensitive emulsions which are placed within the image receptor the capability or the rate at which it can absorb the radiation and convert it into a latent image that is the speed of the film now the speed of the film how we determine it or uh, how to uh, uh, tell or uh, suggest a, a specific kind of speed for a specific purpose that depends upon the kind of uh, extra unit you are using or the kind of image you are taking and the kind of the patient uh, compatibility also now if you take the ultra speed of the d film it is a slightly lesser uh, speed when compared to the ecta speed or the e speed now the e is much faster in the conversion of this uh, particular uh, image now since the speed is uh, very fast when compared to d uh, d the sharpness of the image slightly varies in this particular speed uh, film subclass when the <clears throat> if we compare it to the sharpness of a d film the e film sharpness is slightly lesser because uh, specifically owing to the property of uh, excessive speed of this film 
Now, what is the advantage of e-film? Now, since the speed is faster, you are reducing the patient exposure. Hence, uh, the time period for which you are exposing the image receptor as well as the tissue or uh, tissues of a human uh, of the patient is much more lesser when compared to D. So, to strike an optimal balance, we normally use the e-speed slightly uh, uh, compromising on the sharpness of the image which can be compensated by the projection geometrical uh, characteristics and, uh, and we use it for interval periodical films. Now why the speed varies I'll be talking about a little later it is basically uh, dependent upon the emulsion particles which I'll be showing you. So these are the different types of uh, uh, interval uh, pictures, uh, interval films, your occlusal uh, films you can see right over here. You have your bite wings with your tabs, various sizes of interval periapical films and a conglomerate of the films. So what uh, basically this image receptor consists of? Now as I told you, it nothing. it is a vehicle matrix which holds the uh, light sensed immersion within inside. So that this vehicle matrix provides the strength it requires, the flexibility the image receptor requires, the handling properties uh, image receptor requires and, and uh, the reception of the x-rays into a latent image is taken care by the light emulsion, uh, light specific emulsions. So the base it is basically consisting, it consists of a polyester, polyethylene tetraethylate uh, uh, gelatinous matrix which is nothing, uh, which is about 0.2 mm thick we can see in the schematic representation and the emulsion we have your silver halides and your vehicle matrix. We can see an enlargement of the same uh, specific uh, schematic diagram we see the double emulsions which is nothing but the light specific uh, areas with a uh, gelatin uh, matrix <coughs> or the vehicle matrix in which it, these uh, colloidal uh, light specific emulsion grains are suspended and hence it can be exposed it is a uh, uniformly distributed throughout the image receptor and the hardness or this flexibility is given by the uh, gelatinous uh, uh, or the uh, basic ground matrix which is nothing called which is which is called the base <coughs> now the, what are the silver halide gra grains it is basically uh, uh, halide grains of a uh, silver uh, bromide or a silver iodide which is basically used now the iodine is basically as added to the silver halide crystals to increase the sensitivity that is the, the receptiveness of this uh, silver halide grains to excess and then convert it into a latent image now, as I told the E films and the D films, basically the difference uh, is in the speed. Now, in E films, you have your tabular grains, which is uh, which is around 1.6 micrometers. And in your D films, you have your globular grains. Now, this tabular and globular grains is uh, basically responsible for the speed of the film. Now, how is that? Now, if you see the cross-sectional or the frontal view of the uh, two uh, pictures or the two grains, you see the tabular uh, grains over here, which is nothing but the frontal view. You, and you have the con uh, uh, globular uh, frontal view, which is nothing but the D-speed film uh, grains. And this is the E-speed uh, film grains. Now, the exposure of these uh, uh, grains to the X-rays is much more higher in this particular uh, uh, grains when compared to a globular, basically owing to the cross-sectional uh, area of the uh, uh, particular grain. Now, so the greater the cross-sectional area which is offered by the tabular uh, grain forms, more is an amount of X-rays which can hit this particular grain and hence the more uh, at a single point of time, more uh, greater number of X-rays are being converted into X-rays into a latent image when compared to a globular which occupies a minimal uh, cross-sectional area when compared to a tabular form. If you see the uh, side views, most of the cross-sectional area is being uh, uh, wasted in the side views over here wherein it is not exposed to the X-rays. The basic cross-sectional area which is useful for conversion of uh, or production of a latent image is your frontal view wherein tabular form has a greater cross-sectional area. Hence, the speed is increased over here that is in your E-films or Ectavision films. Now the film packet is the image receptor comes in a film uh, specifically designed uh, film packets. Now the specifically designed film packets is the first is a plastic cover. Now the plastic cover is nothing but a uh, um, means to ensure there is no cross contamination between the 
patient and the uh, dental physician. It's basically for contamination free uh, purpose. No, next we have the black wrapping paper. It is since you all know that it is a light sense to immersion. Any ambient light or surrounding light which is not produced by the X-ray film or not uh, specific to the area of interest will lead to darkening of the film. So we have to uh, save or protect the light sensitive immersions from ambient light. Hence a black wrapping paper is used to cover the entire image receptor. Now then we have the main uh, component your X-ray film itself and the back side uh, since the wrapping paper is a total wrap, uh, wraps around the image receptor, so we have front side and a back side of a uh, wrapping paper, and then and then we have a lead foil. Now lead foil is nothing but to reduce the patient exposure from the scattered radiation or the secondary radiation which I talked about in this previous class. Now the X-rays when it interacts with matter, there's always a production of a scattered radiation or a secondary radiation which is not useful for the production of a latent image on the image receptor. In, instead, it decreases the uh, properties or the sharpness uh, of the image receptor giving rise to a blurring edges which is not needed. Uh, so it is a double pronged effect. We do not need an excess uh, exposure to the patient and we also need to safeguard the geometric properties of the image uh, uh, produced on the image receptor. Hence, we use a lead foil which absorbs these uh, secondary or scattered radiation and uh, hence reducing the exposure. Now we have extra oral films which are nothing but indirect exposures. Now uh, we have seen the uh, other kind of direct exposure films wherein they are directly sensitive to the x-rays itself. Hence, it produces a latent image. But what happens in extra oral films is it is not sensitive to X-rays as such, but it is sensitive to visible light as, uh, which might be produced by the uh, source itself or by the chemicals within of uh, adjunct uh, materials which convert these X-rays into visible light. Now if you see the two types over here, the screen films and the intensifying screens. Now the screen films, films are nothing but films which are responsive to light itself, that is visible light. That means it, uh, the visible light has to be within the spectrum of Vibgeor, which is uh, visible to the naked eye. So these screen films are not responsive to X-rays as such, but they are responsive to visible light to produce a latent image. Now on the other hand, we have an intensifying screen, which is also an indirect exposure film. But the only difference is intensifying screens have chemicals which absorb X-rays, convert them into visible light. And then this visible light is receptive, uh, it is taken up by the films to produce an image. So we are using X-rays over here and we use visible uh, light over here, but both of them are indirect and uh, the end product being the films are uh, responsive to visible light only. So the source varies over here, but the, the exposure remains the same. So what are the screen films? Uh, as I told you, it is nothing but an indirect exposure kind of uh, uh, image receptor, receptive to only visible light. Now the, it is not uh, receptive to the entire spectrum of the VIBGR or the visible light, but only to specific wavelengths and frequencies. Now depending upon which frequency or wavelength it is responsive to, it is uh, further classified as blue sensitive and green sensitive lights. We have two uh, commercially available, one is the Ectavision films and one is the T-Mat films wherein Ectavision is sensitive to the blue wavelength of the vi uh, visible light and hence produces a latent image and the green sensitive of the T-Mat films is sensitive to the green uh, uh, wavelength hence producing a latent image. The most important difference between both the commercially available screen films is the ability to uh, allow crossover or not allow crossover. What is this crossover? Now if you see in this Ectavision, which is nothing but an anti-crossover uh, screen film, we see the various uh, parts in this. We have the screen support, we have the phosphor coating which is nothing but uh, which is res uh, uh, receptive to the visible light which is responsible for the production of a latent image. Now we have a film base upon which the uh, latent image is produced upon because of the phosphorescence. Uh, uh, created by the phosphor coating, the front and the back coating. Now the only difference over here is it has a 
crossover control layer which is inhibits the crossover of light from one side to the other side now if you see this helps in the increasing the uh, properties or the geometrical properties or the sharpness of the image now if we compare this to a T mat or a crossover uh, no uh, limitation of a crossover if you take T, uh, T mat films we see how these rays cross over from one side to the other side hit the other phosphor coating on the back side again create a minimal amount of phosphorus and that phosphorus is again reflected back to the film base so the exposure of the film base is both from the frontal side as well as the back so that in uh, uh, destroys the film properties to some extent creates a kind of blurring or a secondary uh, second kind of image so the sharpness is uh, uh, compromised over here now if we compare this to the ecta vision which is nothing but an anti crossover we see how even though the light rays pass from one side to the other side the phosphorus which is produced is limited by the crossover control layer so the secondary radiations which is produced from the phosphor coating is totally limited by the uh, crossover control layer hence protecting the film base from being exposed from the back side so we have an uh, limited uh, only frontal side exposure so with the in, uh, sharpness increases the geometric properties increases the only uh, problem with it is we don't have uh, frontal and back uh, exposures and uh, 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 production of uh, exposing the uh, film base to two kinds of uh, radiations so the patient exposure increases the time period for which your film has or the patient of the film has to be exposed it increases when compared to a T mat is the single ray pro is producing uh, double kind of uh, uh, image exposures even though the expo uh, uh, blur there's uh, some kind of blurring uh, in the image but the total amount of exposure is far more uh, uh, far more less when compared to an extra vision now the other kind of uh, indirect exposure films is your intensifying screens which is nothing but X, uh, these X-ray films are responsive to X-rays but these X-rays are converted into visible light and then this visible light is projected upon the film base which is responsive, uh, which is responsive to it and then uh, a latent image is produced. Now the, uh, we, uh, the basic principle upon which it works is phosphorescence. Now we have the various components of an intensifying screen. You have your base, you have your phosphor coating and your film and the opposite opposite side the same phosphor coating and the base so when x-rays hit this phosphorus uh, phosphor coating over here it produces phosphorus uh, depending upon what kind of materials we are using over here uh, most uh, commonly the rare earth metals are uh, used over here lanthanum uh, and etc which are responsive to x-rays and produce a visible light via phosphorus uh, process and this uh, visible light is then responsive as you can see over here light rays responsive to the these light rays and the, hence the latent image is produced over here now the grids is nothing but a specific adjunct which are used uh, with these uh, kind of films in a, uh, areas wherein there is increased amount of patient exposure such as your extraoral films as such wherein your kilo voltage of the film uh, x-ray machines itself is much more higher the patient exposure is higher now a larger area or a denser area is taken into consideration and hence the exposure or the dosage of radiation is increased to reduce the amount of patient exposure without compromising on the image quality we use something called as grids, grids which is invented by uh, Bucky in 1915 now it, not, it does nothing but it reduces or uh, uh, the scatter radiation now this scatter radiation is useless radiation which is not useful uh, when uh, while taking these uh, particular films and when we take a uh, denser uh, pictures or denser images using high kilo voltage pictures there's huge amount of uh, scatter radiation now far more greater than what we encounter with uh, intraoral films or direct uh, exposure films now this scatter radiation is not useful for the image production it only attributes to the increased patient exposure which is not needed so this to counteract or remove uh, this scatteration 
grids are nothing but a specific mechanical contraption which has interspacings of radio opaque and radio lucent materials now this radio lucent material allows the primary beam which is parallel and straight and perpendicular uh, to the x-ray receptor now this uh, primary beam is allowed to pass through the radio lucent areas and the radio opaque areas which are primarily made of lead are absorb the various uh, scattered radiation or secondary radiation which are produced at different other angles other than the parallel uh, primary beam as you can see over here the primary beam when it encounters with a mass there are secondary uh, radiations or scattered radiations which are not along the path of the primary beam but at different other angles as you can see over here now this primary beam is aligned with the radio lucent uh, windows of the grid and hence the primary beam is allowed to pass through but the scattered radiation being at a different angulation are not allowed to pass through they hit the lead uh, radio opaque areas over here or uh, dense materials and these uh, lead uh, plates absorb the scattered radiation and do not allow the passage of this onto the film now the various uh, different patterns of grids are available depending upon what kind of image we are taking now the uh, linear uh, grids and the cross grids now the linear grid are nothing but a linearly arranged uh, radio opaque and later recent uh, dense and lighter areas In the cross grids we have as you can uh, see over here the cross of blocks of uh, radio lucent or uh, lighter areas with uh, denser areas the only uh, of course the cross grid uh, produces a much more finer image but the only problem with the cross grid is if the projection is in a two directional way now if we uh, take the linear grid the linear grid is in one uh, direction if you uh, see the uh, primary beam all the primary beams along the left to right region can pass through the uh, uh, lighter areas and the scattered radiations gets uh, absorbed by the uh, radio opaque or the denser lead areas now if the uh, radiation or a primary beam is in up down uh, areas now in this uh, particular uh, linear grid even then your primary beam passes through the lighter areas and the scattered radiations get uh, stopped by the lead areas but that is not the case with the cross grid wherein a change in the uh, kind of primary beam from a left to right to an up down, up down uh, region these particular uh, radio lucent areas stop the primary beam also so they are thereby decreasing the uh, although decreasing the patient radio uh, patient exposure over here we are trying we are increasing the uh, radiation dosage to produce the same uh, kind of image onto the image receptor this cross grids even though it has its own uh, disadvantages is specially useful in uh, high uh, voltage uh, CTs or uh, MRIs wherein uh, the patient exposure the kilo voltage is much uh, more on the higher side wherein uh, the primary aim of the dental physician would be to reduce the patient exposure to keep it to a minimal uh, 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 minimal limits that is where your cross grid is uh, useful for but for all practical purposes within the chairs at the chair side uh, intraoral films or extraoral films used on, the, on a routine basis at the chair side we use linear grids now the types of grids depending upon uh, uh, the orientation of these uh, lighter or the denser uh, areas we have focus grids or parallel grids now we see <coughs> a parallel grid is uh, useful for uh, when wherein your source and your image receptor is at a greater distance that is to say when your uh, beams are more or less parallel to each other since owing to the distance between the source and the image receptor now these uh, parallel beams are then uh, used in uh, uh, conjunction with a parallel grid since the beams are much more uh, parallel to each other now if we uh, reduce the distance between the source and the image receptor that is to say the beams are not so parallel but that divide uh, divergent when compared to a uh, parallel beam in this case we use a focus grid which aligns the radio uh, denser areas and the lighter areas to the divergent beam of the primary uh, which is of primary nature 
So if you see over here, wherein the focal spot is much more nearer to the image receptor, your primary beam, uh, primary beams are more divergent in nature uh, because there is no, uh, no distance between the image uh, source, image and the uh, source. Hence, these denser areas are aligned at that specific angle along the primary beam. Hence, allowing these primary beams and the secondary radiations are absorbed by the lead beams. Now, if on the other hand, if you take the uh, image uh, receptor and the source distance, which is much more farther and enables uh, the beams to attain a more parallel nature, we use a parallel grid, which uh, is in line with your primary beam. So what are the disadvantages? One is the increased patient exposure, primarily because we are cutting down the uh, secondary or the scattered radiation, which although is uh, helps in the image production, uh, although it has a derogatory effect on the uh, final image which is produced, but still nevertheless hence uh, produces a specific image. So since we are cutting down those uh, scattered or uh, secondary radiation, we have to increase the exposure or uh, patient exposure by increasing the amount of uh, the primary beam. So that is one uh, particular disadvantage. The other disadvantage is your grid cut off. Now what is this grid cut off? Now if you see, if the image receptor and the source distance is not properly estimated and if we use a particular kind of uh, a grid which is not suitable to that image source uh, uh, distance we can see how over here this being the source and this is your primary beam structures which are both divide, uh, divergent as well as uh, parallel to these uh, areas now if in this case we use a parallel a kind of grid without using a focus grid we see how this radio opaque or denser lead areas cuts off even the primary beam now this uh, uh, structure is basically meant to reduce the uh, scattered or absorb the scattered or the secondary radiation but in this case uh, which is uh, since the area uh, grid which we use is parallel but the image or the primary beam is uh, divergent at a specific angle even the primary beams along with the scattered radiation gets uh, absorbed by this green colored uh, grid uh, dense materials which is not the case in this area so this particular area which is representative of, of a small part of image gets totally cut off and this particular image is blank over here which has to be uh, in actuality uh, representative or small part of the image uh, produced by the primary beam but because of the nature or the uh, angulation of this uh, particular grid material we have this grid cutoff which is seen as a blank area and that decrease or decreases the image characteristics or decreases the amount of information which has to be obtained from the specific area of interest. Now we have talked about the different films which are used uh, in this particular in a dental setup at the chair side, the direct exposure or the indirect exposure. Now whatever may be the kind of film which we use, whatever may be the size or whatever may be the kind of uh, exposure to which uh, the particular film is exposed to, all these films have to be processed wherein the total process of conversion of a latent image which is either produced by the x-rays or by the visible light depending upon the kind of film which we use this latent image which is produced and stored within the image receptor has to be developed into a, a actual image which has the different shades of gray your uh, that is to say uh, your radio opaque and the radio lucent areas now the whole process of conversion of this latent image into an actual real image is uh, your image processing. Now this image processing uh, primarily requires your uh, dark room where since your uh, dark room has to be ambient, uh, it safeguards your image receptor from the ambient light. Your dark room should have few characteristics which enables or enables the uh, uh, dental physician to uh, uh, obtain the exact information uh, from the uh, patient area of interest without any problems. 
Now, what are the requirements of this darkroom? First is the first and foremost, you should have a sufficient area of a uh, you know, working area, minimum of four into five feet uh, of your darkroom area. The second one is a safe light, which uh, safe light is nothing but a red uh, 15 watt bulb with a red GBX filter, which is which is to say that this particular light has no effect or has a most minimal effect on the image receptor, which is not responsive to this kind of light. Hence, we do are the dangers of a production of a uh, darkening of the image is uh, reduced. But this safe light, even though it is used, it has to be uh, used at a distance of four feet above the working area. That is your processing uh, areas. And the most important is no light leaks. Uh, that is the most important uh, area to safeguard the image characteristics obtained on an image receptor. There should be no uh, absolutely zero ambient light. So we have to uh, totally make sure that all the windows and the doors are totally locked up with a black paper uh, wrapped around it. And also we should uh, ensure the sufficient ventilation so that all the fumes from the uh, uh, chemicals which are stored in the processing areas are uh, totally uh, taken out and also with sufficient amount of humidity. Now we have a specific test uh, called as penny test, which is made, which makes sure that there is no ambient light. There is no light leaks uh, in the specific dark room. Now what is done in this particular process is we take two films exposed at the same time in a patient. Now we take one film and uh, place a penny coin uh, on the uh, IOPR film on one uh, particular film and the other film is uh, processed in the normal manner as which uh, on a routine basis as done. Now the whole through the whole process after the completion of the processing we, t uh, we then develop the uh, film or the duplicate film upon which the penny was placed. Now in the final image if we see the outline of this penny uh, coin on the final image on the, uh, in the IOPR it is to say that even before that particular film was processed within the processing solutions, it was exposed to la, some uh, kind of ambient light or light leak, which has exposed the surrounding areas, except the uh, area upon which the penny coin was placed, since it is uh, impervious to visible light and it has produced a kind of darkening. Now, if there is a uniform picture with no clear outline of the penny, that is to say your ambient light or your light leaks is kept at a zero. So that ensures that we do have no kind of a, a light leaks within the dark room. Now, if you come to the main processing solution, all these films have to go through a, a specific protocol, starting with a developer solution, a water bath, a fixer solution, and again, another water bath. So what happens in this developer solution? The developer solution, the latent image which is produced is nothing but an image we are, or an image receptor which consists of silver halide green uh, grains of two types one which is exposed to the x-rays and another which is not exposed to the x-rays now the silver halide crystals which are exposed to the x-rays are converted into metallic silver in a developer solution now how that happens is uh, basically uh, the electrons or the free electrons which are uh, uh, present within the silver halide crystals are given out which uh, reduces uh, the neutral uh, silver uh, ions. So the solution or the developer solution it is, it is nothing but an electron donor and the silver halide crystals which is exposed take up these electrons get converted into metallic silver so and uh, hence produces crystalline silver uh, ions. So, so as to say in a developer solution, the areas which are exposed to X-rays take up the electrons which are donated by the developer solution, get converted into crystalline silver and then uh, produces uh, which is nothing uh, but black in color and hence the areas which are exposed by the X-rays get a dark image on the final uh, image receptor. Now the areas which are not exposed to X-rays do not uh, get converted into metallic silver primarily because it was not exposed to the x-rays they do not take up the electrons which are donated by the developer solution and do not convert into a dark uh, structure uh, of metallic grains hence these particular grains are easily washed up in a fixer solution so moving on to the composition for developer <coughs> we have the primary developer itself which is nothing but a phenidoin and a hydroquinone 
the primary developer being phenidoin which is the primary electron donor to these uh, silver uh, exposed silver halide crystals the, the hydroquinone is a secondary developer which uh, replenishes the electrons which are lost by the phenidoin so it is a kind of a replenisher to the primary or an adjunct uh, or a helping hand to the primary developer or phenidoin then we have the activator which is nothing but sodium or potassium hydroxide which nothing basically maintains the alkaline ph of the developer solution since all these uh, chemicals are highly active in a, an alkaline ph this tends to ma maintain the ph at alkaline levels now your preservative your uh, sodium sulfide it basically prevents the oxidization of the developer the primary developer and then we have the restrainer the potassium bromide or uh, benzotriazole which not which does not uh, which is actually uh, restrains the uh, development of unexposed silver halide crystals now in the normal process only the exposed silver halide crystals get developed at a faster rate in the initial period of time but as we increase the amount of uh, developing time now even the unexposed silver halide crystals also get exposed now to prevent that from happening we reduce or limit ourselves uh, limit the developing time as well as this restrainer which is uh, present within the developer solution helps us in that now the, after finishing this we just uh, we wash off the chemicals or the developer chemicals in a water bath and then we move on to the fixer solution now the fixer solution basic uh, idea behind uh, using a fixer solution is to fix the developed uh, image receptor that is to say we have to remove the underdeveloped or the undeveloped or unexposed silver halide crystals at the same time it also has to harden the emulsion of the exposed uh, crystals thereby uh, uh, increasing the handling capabilities so it shrinks and hardens the emulsion as well as at the same time it removes underdeveloped or undeveloped uh, silver halide crystals so within this we have your clearing agent which is nothing but uh, ammonium thiosulfate which basically clears away the unexposed silver halide crystals it washes away the non metallic uh, silver uh, halide crystals your acidifier since all these uh, components are uh, much more active in an acidic ph the alkaline ph has to be converted into an acidic ph which is done by acetic acid a ph of 4 to 5 is maintained your preservative your ammonium sulfate basically uh, is prevents the oxidization of this uh, clearing agent by the atmospheric air your final hardener which increases the hardening uh, which increases the handling capabilities of the film it uh, shrinks the emulsion hardens the emulsion squeezes out the excessive amount of fixer hence reducing uh, after uh, uh, exposure fixing and that is done by the aluminum sulfide the basic process is your aluminum salts over here your aluminum sulfide the aluminum goes and fixes up or acts with a gelatinous matrix within the uh, image receptor produces or uh, combines and produces aluminum complexes which were which are much more harder in nature now after this uh, the total the, the total processing technique wherein you are uh, uh, developing or your washing your fixation and a final wash off the whole thing the processing technique can be of two types one is a manual type and another one is an automatic type the most commonly used is a manual type which has more better handling properties which is more uh, in the control of the dental physician or the dental technician rather than an automatic processor now in a manual processor we again have two uh, types we have the time temperature method we have the visualization method your visualization method is a most common kind of, uh, kind of method wherein the uh, uh, operator or the technician Uh, at a regular intervals checks the darkening of the film against the red light or the red safe light uh, which show, which ensures uh, he ensures or it is totally subjective in nature as to uh, when the sufficient amount of developing has been done whether all the structures which are uh, supposed to be seen are seen in the image receptor now uh, depending upon that he continuously goes about uh, uh, processing the image receptor now other than that we have the time temperature method which is even more uh, accurate but not totally under control or difficult to maintain now this time temperature method is nothing but a specific uh, temperature is maintained for the developing solution 
for which a specific amount of time for which we have to immerse the image receptor within the solution. Now, if you see over here, if we draw the uh, graph between the time and the degrees, we see as the temperature increases, the amount of time for which that uh, uh, image receptor has to be developed also decreases. The optimum temperature being 68 degree Fahrenheit for which corresponding amount of time is four and a half minutes. Now, as the time uh, as the uh, temperature increases uh, about 75 or 80 degrees, uh, 80 degrees Fahrenheit is the maximum temperature wherein your developing time is about two minutes. If you see the intersection of these both X and Y coordinates. Now, this is uh, totally dependent upon the strict maintenance of the temperature of the developing solution or the strict maintenance of uh, time and uh, less uh, dependent upon the subject uh, subject of the radi radiographic technician. Now, the other kind of processing technique is an automated processing technique, which uh, totally uh, removes any subjective kind of errors, uh, wherein a specific uh, rollers are used uh, within this, wherein the rollers pass this image receptor through the developing solution, then the water solution, and finally the fixer solution, and ultimately uh, ejects it out into a bowl. Now, this is totally uh, not dependent upon the subjective, totally mechanized. Now, it was first introduced in 1910, but it has its own pros and cons. The advantages, obviously it is quick. It removes any kind of subjective errors. It is uh, much more faster. No need of any darkroom since the equipment comes itself in a closed uh, compartment wherein you just have to introduce the film inside the compartment and obviously it is portable we don't have to uh, carry around the uh, solutions uh, with us uh, to anywhere uh, we have to go so here but the disadvantages over here is the initial investment maintenance cost which is uh, since it is totally mechanized and roller marks which are uh, most common uh, commonly found over here which is nothing but these the roller marks are uh, the marks which are produced or the tracks of these rollers which uh, enables or pushes these uh, uh, image receptors through the various solutions. Now these rollers leave uh, uh, their marks upon the final uh, image uh, or the final x-ray image which has to be finally washed out. Now that is the most common disadvantage over here apart from the fact that it is also expensive. Now that brings us to the end of the films uh, which are used uh, and the various types of grids and the processing techniques which are most commonly used by the dental physician on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is uh, about the automated film process as you can see over here uh, in the film, uh, in the picture over here. This is a totally enclosed compartment which uh, the top box has been removed over here. So there is no need for uh, any uh, specific dark room. The uh, total compartment is uh, made sure that there are no light leaks. The portal of introduction is from the uh, right side over here, wherein the final image is to uh, final X-ray uh, film has is ejected out from the other side. Now this is placed uh, in uh, sequence: your developer solution, your water solution, and your fixer solution. Now after the introduction, it, uh, these rollers, as you can see over the parallel uh, bars which takes uh, this uh, pushes this particular uh, X-ray film into the developer solution, takes in and brings out, again pushes it into the water uh, compartment and finally into the fixer compartment and ejects it out. Now these rollers, although it has its uh, uh, own advantages, once it, uh, uh, it squeezes out the developer solution, uh, once it is uh, finished up with the developer and hence there is no carryover of the rollers or liquid or the developer liquid from the uh, developer into the subsequent uh, uh, compartments. Also, it helps in the uh, uh, traveling or the pro process of pushing the X-ray films. Also, since it is mechanical and it is continuously in motion, the developer solution or the fixer solution is continuously agitated. So there is no settling of this particular liquid. There's continuous agitation. So this uniform exposure of the film to the uh, developing or the fixer solution. So that being the functions of this uh, rollers in an automatic film processor, the main disadvantage is the roller marks, which uh, under, uh, inevitably they leave these uh, roller marks onto the final image, which has to be again manually washed away. So this uh, brings us to the end of uh, the films which are used in uh, uh, intro and extra films, which are uh, used in a normal dental setup and the processing techniques. Thank you all.